I'm very glad to be with you today. I'm uh, glad to, you know, to open the session of this conference. This conference is co-organized by the Center for Research on Democracy and Law of the University of Macedonia, whom I represent because I'm the director of the center, and also uh, of, uh, by the Heinrich Böll uh, Stiftung, the foundation Heinrich Böll of Greece, uh, uh, that is also represented, and uh, Michaelis with this will probably uh, speak after me and explain what Heinrich Bell is doing. So the conference is uh, on the Green New Deal, the European Union's Green New Deal after the pandemic, after the COVID-19 pandemic, concerns and revelations, because we thought that the pandemic is leaving us slowly now, and we are going back to some sort of regularity, only the regularity that we're going back to is not really what we would like to have. We would really may want to have a sort of leap, a quantum leap if, if possible, in, 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 several, uh, in several policies, most important of which of course is the green policy, the green, uh, the green turn of our economies, of the society and the way we live. Because this pandemic, of course, has also shown, the, has shown to all of us the vulnerability of uh, humanity, of course, and of the, the planet in, uh, in, in front of pandemics, in front of environmental uh, hazards of a grand scale. And it has also shown to us that the, the planet is totally interconnected. Now we're all just one and only one humanity. Everybody has understood this. Now is the time to talk, to start talking about what will ensue the pandemic and especially uh, the green policies and it's more especially, more particularly the European Union and its ambition to be the avant-garde of the uh, green, new, with its Green New Deal of the, uh, this turn in the economy and ways of living in all the world. So uh, let me try to, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to speak, of course, uh, I'm not one of the speakers. Just let me uh, give you an outlook of what we are doing here. Uh, the uh, the uh, conference, today's conference, is, uh, is a part of the Conference on the Future of Europe. It's actually one of the very first events in Greece that is associated with the Conference on the Future of Europe that you might know has been launched on the 9th of May, 2021, a um, little bit more than a month ago. and. This conference has been uh, designed by us and by our friends, uh, the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Greece, not as an academic, not as a classic academic event. We wouldn't like that uh, at all, but we, would, we wanted and we designed uh, an event that is multilateral, that, is, uh, uh, that, covers, that, that, that covers more areas and uh, we have, an excellent representative of uh, the academia, one of our Greek uh, university professors who is the most active in the green agenda, Ms. Manuela Dusi, that uh, she is the, uh, uh, she the keynote speaker, if you will. She's going to talk about the climate crisis and the European Green Deal after the pandemic. Uh, I will be presenting, presenting of course, each, each speaker as they come. And so there's one academic, academic, but there's also a member of uh, uh, the Greek civil society uh, and actually a representative of the most venerable, if you want, the oldest and one of the most active uh, uh, organizations of civil society in Greece, which is the Elinike Teria Perivalos Ke Politismu, the Greek Society for Environment and Cultural Heritage and Culture, if you want, in Greece, active since the beginning of the 1970s. And one of the uh, I would say most efficient um, mediators between the uh, uh, political sphere, but with the political power and the society. So there's also a representative of civil society. And also lastly, hopefully at least, there's also a representative of the local administration, which is absolutely fundamental for this perspective for the Green New Deal. We cannot have a Green New Deal, operational at least, without the active involvement of local administration. So uh, Yanis Anastasakis will, uh, I hope at least, uh, represent the um, mayor uh, and the municipality of Heraklion, Greece. 
because he's a deputy mayor who has in charge uh, all these matters of uh, environment, for example. And so there's, there's, there's th this is the tripartite, if you want, uh, scheme, academia, civil society, local administration. So I think I've said enough. And I would like now to turn to, to uh, uh, Mr. Michaelis uh, uh, Woudis, who is the director of Heinrich Bell Foundation Greece. So Michaeli, your, uh, the floor is yours. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Papadopoulos. Uh, warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Please let me take two to three minutes to just tell you a few words about what we are and uh, who we are and what we do actually for the ones who might not know us. And then to share a couple of thoughts on why I think this conference is particularly important, uh, especially at this moment in time for Greece and for Europe overall, uh, at least from our perspective. So the Heinrich Böll Foundation is a German political foundation. It's affiliated with the German Green Party, the Bündnis 90 Grünen, as it's called in German. Uh, we're headquartered in Berlin, uh, but we have offices all over the world in 24 countries, to be precise. So we are an international network that acts as a think tank and the catalyst for green visions, green ideas, strategies and policies reforms uh, towards a democratic and socio-ecological transformation of the society and of the economy. Uh, our office here in Greece, we're based in Thessaloniki, um, uh, started its activities back in 2012, and our work in the country uh, mainly intends to foster democracy and democratic governance, the protection of human rights, uh, gender equality is a pillar of our work. Uh, we promote political dialogue and we develop, of course, new concepts and practices, or at least we try to establish them further, such as social solidarity economy, uh, with an overall target and overall ambition uh, of uh, social ecological transformation, as I said before, uh, for the overall objective of the foundation. Within this context now, uh, we really believe, uh, and I totally agree with what Professor Papadopoulos said, before about uh, that the uh, local level is particularly important if we're talking about a green deal at EU level. How we reach from Brussels and the European institutions to the citizens of the European regions is essential. We've seen the consequences on, of not doing that in the, the recent past. So uh, in our view, the, the Green Deal is not just one deal, let's say, but the, it's uh, consisting of many different deals that have to take into consideration the local realities, the very different local realities that the different European regions uh, are facing. It's different characteristics. For instance, there are regions in Europe that are facing the consequences of the energy transition. We have uh, clear examples here in Greece and West Macedonia and Megalopolis and Peloponnese. Uh, we have numerous regions all over Europe, not just in Greece, uh, that are confronted with uh, big demographic challenges. Uh, and most of them are also shrinking regions in terms of population, in terms of uh, their infrastructures and so on. So for a number of reasons that uh, the Green Deal comes at the moment that uh, Europe is desperate actually for a green transition uh, because it brings the resources, but it also gives a clear direction, at least on paper at the moment. Uh, but it can only be green, at least this is what we think and uh, this is what we always stand for, if it's uh, truly uh, social and fair. So if it doesn't leave uh, people behind, if it really is inclusive, and if it's a practical expression of respect of the environment, but also of people's concerns. And this is the key challenge that we're facing at the moment, how we actually listen um, to uh, the people's concerns. And this is also the thought behind today's conference. This is what we wanted to show with today's event. How uh, That is also, as uh, Professor Papadopoulos said, part of the conference uh, for the future of Europe, because this is how we actually now try to to share our thoughts about the future of Europe bit by bit with events like this one. So the, the question is how we bring together these levels. So the local level, the local administrations and the local uh, civil society, local initiatives, uh, the academia uh, and the national government and all the way to the EU institutions. It's, it's a pity we sadly didn't manage to get a representative from the EU institutions as well to join us today, although we, we've tried. But this is, I, I think, 
think, the main challenge of this uh, particular moment, how we bring all these levels together, because so far, this is one of the key failures, maybe, uh, if I may, of the, the EU. Um, more than ever, so it's uh, it's key for the success for an initiative from Brussels to, to reach the, um, the local communities, to listen to them, as I said. And it's also essential, and this is my final uh, point, how we link up all of these different pieces of the puzzle. So the recovery and resilience plan and the funding that comes with it, the Green Deal, the, the, the multi-annual budget of the EU, all the other uh, funding streams. This is more essential than ever, how we manage to have a coherent narrative behind the way we use all this money that seems to be on the table uh, at, the, at the moment. Uh, this thing seems to be already underway, even the European Investment Bank, for example, uh, is committed to dedicating funding to green projects. The key now is uh, what do we mean by that? So uh, having social impact, environmental impact indicators um, as uh, key components of all these projects that we materialize the Green Deal. So how we look, in other words, behind the typical hardcore financial indicators uh, should be our priority to have this softer approach that the Green Deal, the EU, uh, Green Deal should be standing for. At least this is what we believe. So thank you very much for your presence and your interest in such a hot day here in, in Greece today. And I'm really looking forward to the excellent presentations and to the exchange with all of you. Thanks a lot. Yes, okay, thank you, Mr. Wudis. Thank you, thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, to get this straight, this is not only, it is not restricted to environment. Environment is not just a policy sector among others. This is something, the green transition, I mean, is something that covers uh, across the board, all policy sectors. And it cannot but be at the same time, uh, a combination of uh, sustainable economic growth and social inclusiveness as uh, Michaelis with this very well said. And there's also something else that is not very clearly uh, prescribed as a part of the Green New Deal, which is nevertheless a part of it, which is of course the deliberative aspect, deliberative democracy, the concerns of the people, the dialogue uh, at the grassroots level between the people and the, uh, the decision makers. So I would like to point out before we really start, before I, I, I give the floor to uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Emanuela Dusi, um, Everyone here present can uh, ask a question by writing it on chat and Zoom chat, and we will sort of group the questions and uh, so as to have a debate. And of course, for the last half an hour or so, we are going to have also a live debate. So please do not hesitate to take the floor if you know you have something to ask apart from the uh, already written questions. So you can already write, start writing the questions, of course, with the flow of the presentations. So that's it. Okay, so let's start. Um, the first and uh, keynote, if you want the central um, uh, speech today is by Emanuela Dusi, who is a professor of international institutions at the University of Athens, the National Kapodistrian University of Athens in Greece, of course. She's also the holder of a UNESCO chair on climate diplomacy and she also is the director of the Institute of European Integration and Policy. And that's actually how we met as directors of uh, laboratories, uh, university laboratories. And she's a, one of the, as I said in the beginning, one of our greatest experts in uh, the Green uh, Deal. So uh, Mrs. Dusi will uh, talk about the climate crisis in the European Green Deal after the COVID-19 pandemic. So Emanuela, the floor is yours, as we say. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it, is, um, it is a great pleasure to participate in this event and I would like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation and for the opportunity they have given me to share with you some thoughts on the challenges concerning uh, the implementation of the European Green Deal after the COVID-19 pandemic in Greece and in particular on the main goal of achieving climate neutrality by 2050. 
allow me to start with some preliminary remarks and to attempt to draw the bigger picture of the climate crisis. It will allow us to get a better understanding of the policy challenges that um, arise, as well as the different perspectives states have on how to address the issue that shaped international and regional responses. Well, it is now an established fact that climate change is global and that its management requires the cooperation of states with very different and often contradicting interests, priorities, capacities, levels of development, let alone greenhouse gas emissions profiles. There are also some issues of justice involved. The countries primarily responsible for causing the climate change problem are not the ones that will be most adversely affected. So addressing the problem could produce losers as well as winners. And states have very, very different views as to what constitute what would constitute a fair outcome. A second fact that um, we should keep in mind is that the protection against climate change is linked to a public good. And the most difficult, difficult challenge when it comes to public goods is how to ensure the participation of everyone in the effort, especially of those who are most responsible for causing the problem. In other words, we need to find a common pace and, of course, international coordination. However, long delays have hindered the advancement of international cooperation, even though the first international agreement on tackling uh, climate change, that is the 1992 UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, was widely accepted and was signed by almost every country in the world. This convention recognized the importance of the problem and its connection to human activities. It also acknowledged the need for action in order to minimize climate change and mitigate its impacts, but left the details of implementation to be settled later through negotiations within the framework of a mechanism created by the same convention, the so-called COPS, the Conference of the Parties, which meet every year. Therefore, valuable time was lost. Had states started to reduce their emissions once the scientific agreement on climate change was documented, the world would not be in its current unpleasant situation. A very important step was taken in 2015 after repeated appeals from the scientific community and both exhausting and exhaustive negotiations. Some common understanding was found and this was reflected in the Paris Agreement. This agreement modified the original idea of settling targets at the international level and called on the states themselves to formulate national plans for mitigation and adaptation to the impacts of climate change and then communicate them in a manner that facilitates clarity, transparency, and understanding. Additionally, with the Paris Agreement, states should review these policies regularly and do so under international supervision. In a nutshell, this is the institutional foundation of the Paris Agreement, which puts all states on a common path to the gradual decoupling of national economies from fossil fuels. In other words, the Paris Agreement does not require specific cuts to the greenhouse gas emissions as did the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. Instead, it creates a system that requires all countries to pitch in with something, then monitor their progress and continue ramping up efforts. The idea behind this system is that states get to choose their level of ambition and the means of its achievement. In other words, how they will achieve 
the self-determined targets. Others will do it with regulations, others by imposing a carbon tax, others by using the emissions trading system or a combination of these. There are two conditions, however, set by the agreement. The first is regular updating, at least every five years, and the second is an, oblig an obligation of non-regression. That means that they cannot go back. The agreement provides also a dynamic mechanism to take stock and strengthen uh, the ambition over time. So the question that arises is, where do we stand today, six years after, after the adoption of this pivotal agreement? Well, this year, 2021, opens a window of opportunity to better deal with the climate crisis and make progress towards the implementation of the Paris Agreement. And hope lies on a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and on making climate action an integral part of COVID-19 relief plans. But this means that the challenge is not simply to reset the economy, but to shape it in a sustainable way that enables to keep the world below a dangerous rise in temperature and, this is very important, to build more resilient societies. State authorities have never been in a stronger position to boost the sustainable agenda as industry, business and individuals clamor for state aid. So new relationships can be forged with the private sector, introducing conditions that encourage businesses to decarbonize. In other words, global warming should not be seen as a lower priority issue than the pandemic, but as the other side of the same coin. The sooner we react, the greater chances we have to survive. The good news is that uh, the US, the United States, after an unfortunate break, have rejoined the Paris Agreement and promised to achieve carbon neutrality within the next three decades. Further, China has committed to net zero emissions before 2060, and the European Union has the most ambitious plan, the European Green Deal, which is the roadmap for sustainability in Europe for the next 30 years. And since China, the United States, and Europe combined, the European Union combined, and in this order are responsible today for approximately half of global carbon emissions, these commitments sent a clear message to investors, to producers and consumers that the global transition to clean energy is here to stay and that resources have to shift away from fossil fuels. Therefore, we could say that the road to Glasgow, where the next COP, the next World Climate Summit will take place in November, is quite reminiscent of the positive impetus that Paris had in 2015. But let me now focus more on the European Union and its leading efforts to promote a very, very ambitious plan outlined in the European Green Deal. Well, uh, this deal has um, many readings, has mainly two readings, I would say. The first is environmental. It is a project that attempts to protect the climate and sets um, as a priority to make Europe a climate neutral continent by 2050, that is zeroing its carbon emissions in line with the European Union's commitments under the Paris Agreement. The second reading has an economic and I would say a social connotation. The deal aims to create an economic, um, a sustainable economic model which at the same time strengthens Europe's energy autonomy. How will it be implemented? By giving a boost to green technology through a series of um, reforms ranging from the decarbonization of the energy sector and green transport to a circular economy and a new deal, a new agreement on agriculture. It is the beginning of a long journey that will take many years 
And all the changes for the transformation of the economy should be done in a just way. Our colleague mentioned it a while ago, no one should be left behind. Uh, in a just way, especially of, for those who will be most affected, that is the workers and the local communities that have been trapped in polluting economic activities for decades and now should shift towards um, sustainable alternatives. To this end, a new European just transition mechanism has been set up to fund part of this effort. So despite the disruption caused by the coronavirus pandemic to the global economy, achieving the goal of climate neutrality remains a priority for the European Union, as confirmed by uh, the European Council uh, at uh, its uh, uh, last meeting. And the European Council gave the general direction for accelerating climate action by revising, first of all, the quantitative emission reduction target for the current decade, 55% reduction by 2030 compared to the emissions uh, levels in 1990, and also requested the Commission, the European Commission, to assess how all economic sectors can contribute to achieving this target. The Council also pledged that a significant part of the crisis recovery pass package, 30%, will fund um, uh, climate action. So the procedures are quickly progressing and during this summer the first legislative package will be announced. Recently negotiations on the so-called European climate law have concluded. Uh, this law transforms the political goal of climate neutrality into a legal obligation and regulates the necessary steps to achieve uh, transition. It also creates a system for monitoring um, progress and adjusting actions accordingly. I would say that the European Green Deal has also a third reading, an international one. If Europe becomes climate neutral, this is certainly not enough to save the planet since European emissions represent less than 10% of the world total. Giving the example, however, may lead other countries to follow in the same path. For example, the drafting of the Mediterranean Green Deal in the framework of the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership is already being discussed. So the biggest challenge for the European Union is to persuade other countries to follow suit, to create a large coalition for the transition to climate neutrality. And I think that the European Union may facilitate this process by mobilizing its partnership networks, as well as its diplomatic capacity. And uh, I should remind here that the European Union had done something similar before the Paris Agreement with very, very significant and positive results. So how does all this affect Greece? Well, Greece has little contribution to the problem of climate crisis, but uh, it is directly affected by it. And that as such has every interest in advocating for strict measures and in supporting international and regional initiatives. Now, it is expected to align its development process with the requirements of the European Green Deal. And um, I would say here that although the deal is a um, Brussels-led policy, its success relies on the willingness of the member states to follow this path. So how does a country get prepared to implement the transition to climate neutrality. I think that some of the key points, the key elements of this transition are, first of all, the strategic planning that will go beyond the limits of an electoral cycle. Second, the bold financial support of the plan. And last but not least, the support of its people and society in general. 
Well, significant steps have already been taken until now regarding the first two elements and the policy to deal with the climate crisis has gradually begun to take shape. The decision on decarbonization and retirement of the lignite units taken prior to the uh, coronavirus pandemic, the just transition plan uh, that includes um, emblematic investments for the affected local societies in West Macedonia and in uh, Megalopoli, the spread of renewable energy sources or the priority given to the green transition in the recently announced recovery plan, all these are undoubtedly positive developments. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, an increase in effort is needed. How is this effort reflected in numbers? Well, according to the latest data provided by Greece to the United Nations, by 2018, Greece had reduced its emissions by about 12% compared to the 1990 levels. This percentage is estimated to have risen to about 27% by 2020. And this is due to the lignite phase out uh, that certainly contributes to um, uh, improving the country's climate performance and also the pandemic that has put um, the economy in quarantine. But to achieve climate neutrality, <coughs> we must reach 100% in order to correspond to the desired zero carbon emissions. So we still have a long way to go. And we need to look at national development plans as a whole in the light of the new developments. This is very important, mainly in order to prevent investing in energy sources that will be deemed redundant or even useless in the long run, such as those related to hydrocarbon extraction, for example. Legislation could certainly help in this direction. And in recent weeks, um, the adoption of a national climate law is being discussed. Um, and I think that its adoption will help to better organize the transition to climate neutrality, focusing on those areas that need more coordination. And by introducing this law, we will be following the good examples set by other countries inside and outside the European Union. Uh, Greece should, uh, could benefit from uh, a climate law in more than one way. Uh, the country could be assisted to better organize the transition to climate neutrality, but also to regulate the monitoring of progress and the regular review of objectives when and where needed. In addition, the climate law would strengthen the social acceptance of the measures. Suffice to say here, uh, the obvious, such an ambitious law should be supported by the widest cross-party consensus possible, something that uh, seems to be the case at the moment. Well, a national climate law um, is the strongest statement the state can make uh, that it is taking the transformation needed to achieve climate neutrality seriously, as neither the Paris Agreement nor the European Green Deal provide the required um, uh, functionality uh, to implement long-term um, structural changes. Certainly, the target of climate neutrality will need then to be translated into effective policy instruments that deliver results. It will thus require not only the decarbonization of the energy production and changes in all means of transportation, but also radical shifts in other sectors, in agriculture, for example, and the use of land resources. In other words, meeting the target of climate neutrality requires huge, huge changes in the way we work, we move around and live in the way we produce and consume. So what conclusions can be drawn from this uh, brief presentation? Well, achieving the goal of climate neutrality by 2050 
poses challenges to both Europe and Greece. But for Greece in particular, three issues I think that need uh, greater attention. First of all, uh, a reconsideration of the national development plans in all economic sectors um, in order to avoid wrong decisions, like those taken with some uh, lignite plants and which would cost us dearly. This is important to prevent investing in energy sources that, as I said, as I mentioned before, uh, will be deemed redundant or even useless in the long run. Second, the implementation of the just transition plan of the uh, lignite areas, as well as the restoration of their surrounding environment should also be a priority. And third, the support of society needs to be ensured. If we do not integrate society into the new climate era, the project of transition to climate neutrality will fail. So what we should do, I think, is start by building better bridges of communication between uh, science and academia, politics and um, uh, the general public. So we have a lot of lessons here to learn by the coronavirus pandemic. First of all, that we must have systematic, targeted and official state information in collaboration with science. And the same applies to climate change. We need to find a common language of communication to inform the citizens why the transition is needed and keep them in loop regarding the dilemmas that arise in this process. And to explain that there are no magic solutions to the problem, to inform them about uh, the benefits they will gain and how they themselves can also contribute to this effort. Time is not on our side. We must take robust action immediately. So what the coronavirus pandemic has uh, shown is that we need to rely more on scientific knowledge for policy making. The implementation of these decisions, however, presupposes the cooperation of society. And in order to achieve the goal of the target of climate neutrality, it is not enough for governments to take measures and the administration to be committed to the implementation of the objectives, nor the individual awareness of the private sector and organized civil society, the, coordin the coordinated mobilization of all actors and citizens for the part that corresponds to each one is essential. And this also includes the issue of individual responsibility for each one of us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dusis, for this enlightening and very uh, wide, uh, wide range uh, lecture and uh, speech. So I would like just to give another dimension here. You just uh, you mentioned in the end of your speech that we need, of course, we need to build better bridges between, I quote you, science, academia, and of course, policy, policy making and society. Uh, two days ago, I read in the French uh, journal Le Monde, which is a journal of references, you know, uh, a uh, letter by, signed by 138, I think, students of the Ecole Nationale d'Administration, the National School of Administration. Uh, and they were protesting against the incapacity of the uh, National Institute of Public Service, which is the organization, the umbrella organization for all the training of the senior civil servants in France. They were protesting against the inexistence or the uh, non-operational, if you want, character of the uh, training that they are given uh, in terms of the so-called ecological transition in French, that's how they call it. They say that they, uh, this ecological and solidarity transition, social, you know, social transition, should be placed at the center of the, uh, the common, uh, uh, the, the common um, part of the training of all civil servants in all you know, future careers. So if that is a problem in France with all the uh, might that it has, with all the, uh, the several centuries of 
tradition that it carries as to a rational administrative machinery, uh, a set of institutions that, you know, uh, rationalize the public policies and public uh, interventions, and also uh, as to as the big, tra big tradition that it has in training its uh, senior, its high, if you want, civil servants. Imagine if that is a problem in France. Imagine, for example, in Greece. So I think that this dimension, this dimension of training and of education more generally, as to what is implied uh, as uh, you know, by by the green transition agenda, uh, and something that should be common to all branches of administration, of public administration, is something that is really a big. I mean, a, probably a black hole also in Greece, and we should take a hard look at it. So, thank you very much. And now, I would like to to pass to Mrs. Uh, Mr. Excuse me, Mirtiadis Lazoglu, Lazoglu, who uh, represents. Uh, the Greek Society for Environment and Culture, and he is uh, a doctor. He uh, is in charge of the urban and regional planning and the environmental policy coordinator of uh, the Elinikieteria. So he, uh, Mr. Lazo, Mr. Lazoglu will talk about climate change, developing adaptation guidelines for the Greek landscape and cultural heritage, which is a sector where the Elmikieteria is very active. So Mr. Lazoglu, the floor is, your, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let me start sharing the presentation. Okay, you, can you see it? Yes. yes. I believe you can. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Papadopoulos and Dr. Kiriakidis for organizing such an interesting and uh, exciting event and uh, I would like to thank them for their invitation. Uh, let me begin my presentation by stating a few basic facts about uh, El Nikieteria. El Nikieteria has been active since 1972 in the fight for the preservation of Greece's natural environment and cultural heritage. El Nikieteria has fought many significant battles among which the establishment of the marine park of Palonisos the saving of Plaka, the protection of the Delphic landscape of the southern Saronic Gulf, of Pylos, of the Prespa Lakes, of the Tatoi Estate, of part of the area of Marathon, of the Hellenistic Tower of Kea, of many Byzantine churches and historic settlements, such as those of Hydra and other Aegean islands. At the same time, monuments outside the country borders have also been saved from demolition, decay and abandonment, uh, such as the Campanile of San Giorgio de Greek in uh, Venice and the Church of San Pandeleimon or Kizil Kilize in Cappadocia. El Nketeria is also active in uh, environmental education and with its studies and proposals, protects the seas, the forests, and plans for sustainable development, uh, tourism, carrying capacity, and environmental tax reform. All this thanks to the support of sponsors, scientists, volunteers, members, and friends. Uh, in 2017, El uh, recognizing the urgent need to adapt to the new reality the climate change uh, introduces, focused its efforts on the need to promote the adaptation to the expected effects of climate change in Greece. As a result, El participates in the eight-year Life IP Adapting GR program. Its full title is uh, Boosting the Implementation of Adaptation Policy Across Greece and includes a series of actions throughout Greece. This Life IP project is the most crucial project for adapting Greece to climate change. The project aims to catalyze the implementation of the Greek national adaptation strategy and of the 13th uh, regional adaptation action plans through appropriate actions at national, regional, and local levels. Uh, more specifically, this Life IP project seeks to build the capacity of public authorities mandated to plan and deliver adaptation actions and policies, create an effective mechanism to monitor, evaluate, and update adaptation action plans policies, develop, uh, develop pilot, pilot adaptation projects in three regions and five municipalities, raise public awareness of uh, climate change adaptation, uh, mobilize complementary European and national funding 
and other financial to implement adaptation policies. Uh, disseminate good practice examples across Greece, Eastern Mediterranean, and then the European Union. And finally, frame the next adaptation policy cycle, this means after 2026, uh, through evidence-based evaluations and reviews of the Greek national adaptation strategy. The program will run for eight years. It began in 2019 and will be concluded in uh, 2026 and has an overall budget of 14.2 million of euros. The project is coordinated by the Ministry of Environment and Energy, uh, while among the partners are the Academy of Athens, the Bank of Greece, uh, the National Technical University of Athens, uh, the National Observatory of Athens, and also five municipalities, which are namely the municipalities of Komotini, Larissa, Katerini, Agia Nargiri, and Rhodes Island, and three regions, uh, the regions of, the regions of uh, Central Greece, Western Greece, and the region of the Ionian Islands. So what we do in this project, the Linketeria is responsible for a series of educational actions, such as the educational competition and the production of educational material, actions aiming to raise public and stakeholders' awareness about climate change adaptation, uh, such as the production of information material, the preparation of leaflets, the production of TV and radio spots, and among, among other things, the preparation of the first poll in Greece, exploring the beliefs, preferences, and views of Greeks about climate change issues. Let me elaborate a bit further on this poll. This poll took place during the July of 2019, and during the poll, 1,600 telephone interviews were conducted, to residents of all the 13 regions of the country. Uh, as you can see at this slide, the residents of those regions, which are characterized as the most vulnerable according to the Greek national adaptation strategy, these are mainly the regions of West Macedonia, Central Greece, Peloponnese, uh, Southern Aegean and Crete, state that their knowledge about climate change and uh, its effects are very limited. On the contrary, uh, the residents of the regions of Northern Aegean, Attica, Thessaly, and Central Macedonia state that they are, they are well informed about the expected effects of climate change, although uh, these regions are characterized as the least vulnerable to climate change according to the Greek national adaptation strategy. Another interesting finding of the poll was this one, which uh, shows that the interviewees are open to follow recycling and reuse uh, initiatives to minimize the effect of climate change. And they also uh, state that they are willing to use public transport for the same cause. On the contrary, they are not willing to follow a vegetarian-based diet to minimize climate change, and their vote won't be influenced by the importance each candidate gives to climate change issues. Uh, finally, the Greek citizens will accept central policies concerning the promotion of recycling initiatives, the use of renewable energy sources so as to cover the energy demands at public buildings, and the prohibition of the use of plastic. The three research areas of Hellenike Eteria in this Life IP project, which are probably of the greatest value for the today's event, are exploring the effects of climate change on the land use, landscapes, and uh, cultural heritage. Allow me to present you in a little more detail follow regarding the landscape and the cultural heritage uh, themes. The approach is based on the examination of case studies, five for cultural heritage and nine for the landscape. The five uh, cultural heritage pilot case studies are the uh, archaeological site of the ancient machine, the archaeological site of Dilos, the church of Porta Panagia in the regional unit of Tricala, uh, the traditional villages of the central Zagori area, and the old town of Corfu. Uh, for each study area, a multidisciplinary team will assess the impacts of climate change and will propose adaptive measures. More specifically, the steps include the assessment of the values and significance of each site, uh, the understanding of the vulnerabilities uh, of each site, the establishment of indicators for the vulnerability elements, 
the establishment of uh, adaptive capacity in respect of its vulnerability. And finally, following all the above, the grade of danger will be estimated and also a cost benefit analysis uh, will be developed. Currently, the assessment of the archaeological site of ancient machine is performed and will be concluded uh, by the end of uh, September. Concerning the landscape, nine key studies will be assessed using the landscape transects methodology. Uh, here you can see the pile of transects which will be examined. Currently, the assessment of the pillows here, the pillows, ancient machine, Taigetos, Mistras, Sparta, Helos, and Monevasia uh, transect is performed and will be concluded also by the end of September. The selected landscapes will be recorded along narrow sections at a linear resolution of 500 meters, covering from the closest mountain top to the sea or river basin. The subcomponents of uh, the landscape, which tend to vary with altitude, can be included. Uh, the Korean land cover will be the primary data set along its transect, while on site and satellite photo observation will be also used for the refined recording of the existing landscape topologies. Then the prevalent existing landscape topologies will be mapped, and uh, using this methodology, uh, adaptation results at the level of a landscape topology transferable to similar landscape topologies under similar climatic zones uh, will be developed. Finally, through all the above uh, case studies, the assessment of the measures uh, proposed in the regional adaptation action plans will be performed. And additionally, uh, new measure measures will be proposed. Based on these assessments, uh, guidelines for climate change adaptation with regard to landscape and cultural heritage in Greece will be elaborated. Uh, and I believe that this was the last slide of my presentation. So I would like Thank you very much for your attention. And I will be very happy to answer to any questions raised. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lazoglu, for this very dense presentation. Probably too dense because the, I'm, I'm sure there are many of us who would like to know more about what you're doing in more detail. And of course, we'll come back to that in the form of questions. I just wanted to point, it out, point out something here that is, uh, I really think, of importance. The, uh, your work, your operational work, as to the building of indicators concerning vulnerability at the local level, the level of uh, you know, cultural heritage and, of course, landscape. And also, that, that, would, that will lead eventually to a sort of cost-benefit plan and to the creation of an adaptation strategy. This word, this term of adaptation, I think, is key here because we don't really hear this very often. Uh, the fight against climate change is a huge one. It's probably a titanic one. The humanity has to you know, uh, put all its resources in this fight. A part of this fight has to do with the adaptation strategy so as to augment the capacities for, for resilience at the local level. So I think that the most important thing here, if you want to do uh, evidence-based policy making is to build indicators, to build the work based on uh, uh, data and indicators as to uh, what you're doing, actually, as to vulnerability, so that you can adapt yourself better, create an adaptation strategy that can be accepted more easily, probably, by local societies than grand level questions uh, concerning lifestyle, for example, as, uh, as uh, we have seen. Probably a creation of adaptation strategy at the local level will be the door to success as to the ownership of the strategy, especially at local level. So thank you once again. And now uh, we have our last speaker for today. I'm very glad to, to greet uh, Mr. Yanis Anastasakis, who is deputy mayor in the municipality of Heraklion. And he's a civil engineer. And he will, uh, he will talk about the strategy of, the, of Heraklion, Crete, uh, towards energy transition to a low carbon economy. So Mr. Anastasakis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's an honor for me to participate in such uh, a discussion. I consider it vital to talk about these issues and to prepare because the recovery plans are at hand 
So we need to understand why we are doing what we are doing. We need a green recovery from the crisis and the green protection from a possible more severe crisis, that of climate change. There is a steady disadvantage in EU policies. People see it irrelevant with major issues, their everyday lives, and we have critical marketing issues. Allow me to say that. We need some rebranding of EU and the recovery plans give us such an opportunity by connecting the current situation, the everyday life of the citizens with plans that were designed inside and within the crisis and uh, for sure they will be relevant to current issues. What about Iraq? They say it takes a village to save the planet and that's exactly what we are trying to do. We are experiencing climate change in Iraq, environmental degradation, and uh, we have an increasing pressure year by year from tourism development. We want tourists, but what about the capacity of Crete? So we have floods, we have corrosion, we have increasing energy needs that we cannot cover, and we have lack of water, water scarcity. So what are we doing about that? Let me share my presentation with you. First of all, we made a plan for the whole city. Our initiative was to connect Knossos the Mainoan civilization and this landmark that had 1 million visitors per year with the old city of Heraklion, where we have the Venetian civilization with one of the most well-preserved monuments in the Mediterranean, the city, the walls of Heraklion, 350,000 uh, square meters, about 50% uh, bigger than uh, Stavros Nyarchos Park in Athens that most of you are aware of. The goal of this plan is very simple, to bridge the gap between that monument and the old city that was not very um, attractive for someone to visit. And uh, based on that goal, we try to reform the environment. We try to train the people to have a better behavior concerning energy consumption. And we set some very ambitious goals uh, to avoid CO2 emissions by at least 31% in 2030. That goal is based on our commitment in the new covenant of mayors and climate change, our strategy of sustainable urban development of the city of Heraklion, that's the strategy I referred to just a moment ago, a dedicated plan for the improvement of the energy efficiency of public buildings, and of course, all the lessons learned from the tens of projects already implemented in Heraklion. We want to promote the sustainable energy and the energy efficiency because we believe that a resilient and healthy environment will make Heraklion a better place to live and a better place to visit. The main goal of the municipality is to go beyond the national goals for energy transition. The target is already very ambitious, 40% until 2030, and with even as the reference year. So we try to improve energy efficiency in buildings, street lighting, transportation, integrate renewable energy sources wherever that possible, reduce environmental stresses through infrastructure projects. We suffer from the lack of green areas and we try to exploit every opportunity. We have the money to create new public spaces, mostly green, and uh, their values were skyrocketed during the pandemic. We find 
finance from every possible source. With mature designs, it's very easy to find the money to do what you have planned. And uh, something that is vital is to train our technical and responsibles, our engineers through seminars and participation in research projects because their everyday life within the municipality is 90% bureaucratic. There is a lack of vision and no matter how they try, they consume themselves in uh, matters that are of very, very low importance. That needs to change if we want to see the municipalities following state of the art developments. And of course, we try to, aware, to, arise, uh, to raise the awareness of the general public with, uh, with some ad hoc trainings. And uh, we have uh, every year specific ad hoc uh, marketing plans door to door so that they will understand what are the opportunities for their houses and for their businesses. Some progress, we had uh, the MED project Impulse uh, with the Center for Renewable Energy Sources and Saving, a great partner that taught us a lot. I think that triggered our uh, biggest concern about what climate change and what energy saving is. And we have already developed a plan for 76 priority public buildings of Heraklion, already ongoing energy retrofits. And uh, we have a tool to make other mature projects in the, in the upcoming years because it's very difficult to retrofit 76 buildings in only nine years. We are in a good position, you'll see why. Already, we have the ongoing deep energy upgrade of our largest administration building, 1.3 million euros. What is the problem? When we touch a building, an old building, a lot of damages that were hidden are revealed, but uh, the EU money is not targeted to that. So we have an ongoing uh, contract and we need another money, another million to make the building, to make an upgrade at the building. Uh, so this is something that we need to see. Uh, another big success is the energy upgrade of the Pancretan Stadium, 30,000 spectators. 3.2 million euros will uh, save us about 180,000 euros per year. From 250,000, we will reduce the cost to 80,000. And this is very, very critical, not because we need this money for the municipality, because the athletic company of the municipality needs to have a plus in its day in its uh, annual budget. So this can make it sustainable. We can't have deficits in the budgets of the municipal companies. So we can save the company, although its uh, revenues were diminished because of the pandemic. We have already submitted applications for the implementation of uh, photovoltaic integration projects, net metering in five public buildings, and we have already five other buildings uh, on the way. And uh, we are trying to prepare with additional buildings, 13 educational buildings and one elderly care, health, excuse me, health care center. And because we are showing good results and good preparation, two new EU programs for the energy renovation of the city hall, the historic loggia, and one large school are already approved. So they will uh, be with us the next years. We try to mature more and more technical studies. Uh, we have Electra, the program uh, in our mind for energy renovation of public buildings. And we try to exploit our smart city identity by 
installing monitoring systems to see how well we perform in the buildings that we retrofit. Where we have a big delay is the lighting facilities. Although we recorded all of the 24,000 lighting fixtures, we didn't secure some private funding because there were technical and legal issues uh, that came out of the blue. We will manage to have this uh, project, but a lot of things need to change. We try to connect all this strategy with uh, services to the people. So we took advantage of another European project and we bought some electric buses along with uh, regular buses and we provide free transport from seven in the morning until 11 in the, uh, in the evening to give a concrete reason to leave the car outside the historic center. Although it wasn't uh, usual for a citizen of Heraklion to take the bus, it uh, went beyond our expectations and we have already more than 600,000 people using that electric buses. The transport is free, the parking outside the city in key parking spots is also free and we changed the microclimate of the city center with one out of the box idea why we took the initiative to do that because we wanted to create new pedestrian routes on uh, avenues that used to take all the traffic so we wanted to present an alternative and uh, we gain ground step by step and now most of the citizens want the pedestrian routes to expand with uh, probably with uh, obvious advantages to the city environment and its uh, attraction so we will expand the replacement of the conventional public transport fleet with electric vehicles you can see that project uh, that I am referring to, the big avenue, the Kiosins and Didits Avenue, that have been already transformed to pedestrian areas, along with uh, the revitalization of city center parks and playgrounds, hundreds of hectares will be green year by year. And uh, we try to build a puzzle piece by piece. An open mall is on the way. We try to connect areas that we have small shops to serve as an open mall and to create pedestrian areas with all the uh, high tech services that are available from electric bicycles, info kiosks, drive control systems, smart solar benches and you name it. We are planning new infrastructure projects for the relief of environmental stresses. We are very, um, we are afraid that the corrosion in the north coast of Heraklion is going too fast. And we have a monument. The, the Venetian walls are covering the front of Heraklion. So we filed a project of 2 million euros in uh, the current uh, national framework. I hope that they, they will accept our proposal to save the monument. Uh, we try to implement the energy community law in Heraklio. Uh, the problem is that with the, we don't have the majority in the municipality of Heraklion in the board. So it's not a uh, how do you say, it's not common sense to agree even in uh, energy communities. This uh, law changed, but the next municipal authority will have the chance to discuss 
but also to decide. We have only the chance to discuss and some key issues remain at the authority of the municipality uh, of the municipal board. And there you can, you can watch one and only one uh, discussion and you will understand that you can't achieve anything that uh, the municipal authority will gain from that politically. Uh, so I think I have completed my presentation. We have the annual energy days. We try to make conferences and workshops. The pandemics took us behind and we'll continue with the same strategy step by step. I need to say I'm a politician. This is long term and it's uh, not easy for someone to choose this kind of roadmaps long term exhausting i would say we don't have not if, not the people uh, neither the uh, the money to make it happen and politically no one understands until it's too late but we do it because we believe we need to have a concrete plan for the municipality to make it uh, to make it uh, how do you say contemporary with uh, the real needs we don't we don't want fireworks we need some solid politics and uh i you will excuse my english but we have already secured that this plan the strategic development plan will be implemented in the next 10 years because three ministers signed co-signed it we made a, a long 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 discussion with every uh everyone in the city and uh, we managed to have it in the newspaper of the government and this will accompany us until 2030. So no matter if the mayor or the vice mayor is good or bad, this will be the roadmap for Iraklio the next year. Thank you very much. And uh, we would uh, achieve nothing if we didn't have the support of all these partners that are within Iraklion and uh, constantly support us in every good idea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Anastasakis, for this fascinating uh, expose of what a smart city can do. Actually, there's not much it cannot do. There's a lot of things it can do. And I also thank you for being very explicit as to the obstacles that you meet, mainly um, the obstacles concerning the electoral cycles and of course also the electoral system that, is, that was at least uh, prevalent in Greece until recently. Now, one thing that I took from this uh, presentation of yours and I think it would open an avenue of debate is the management of time, is the question, the issue of temporality. This is something that also Emanuela Dusi said and all of us know the big problem concerning climate change policies, which are intersectoral, horizontal, and long-term, all of them, is how to combine some short-term measures that will build alliances with the citizens, with civil society, things such as the retrofitting of public buildings that everyone can see, the greening of avenues, uh, a, 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 a more sustainable, plan for transportation that everyone can see in the term of, for example, four or five years where a municipality can do things, for example. But most of the actions are, as, as Mr. Anastasaki said, long term. And this is a big problem. How do you combine the short term by which you can build alliances because people need concrete stuff, concrete things to see and to believe in so that they can commit themselves politically and morally to what is going on. With the long-term agenda that people don't know, they're not aware of the erosion of the coast in Crete, of the desertification and what that means, because this is too far away for them. They don't even know that, they don't even understand, they're not conscious that it's going to impact on their own children. That's a classical problem of temporality in the political agenda. Thank you for pointing this out. I'm sure that we can discuss this. Many people would like to ask questions on all these smart cities and 
uh, the problems that you are facing, uh, the electoral problems, the political problems, the financing problems, which it was a revelation for us, are very much less prevalent than the other problems, which is also something that is very, I mean, this, this kind of, this kind of uh, general kind of knowledge that everyone thinks that the main problem is how to secure finance. But here came Mr. Anastasakis and told us that we have mature tens of dozens of projects and we didn't have the problem to find the, the uh, we didn't have the, uh, uh, didn't have any problem in finding, in finding fi uh, funding for, for all this. So this is something important as well. Okay, so that, that was it. The, we have done the tour of the question, all the all the presentations have been put in place. As I said in the beginning, uh, this is a combination of uh, academia, civil society, and local administration. And of course, now the, the the floor is open to all of you who are attending this conference. To uh, I don't see any written questions up to now, but you can ask your questions uh, straight away if you want to. You know, uh, present yourselves and and. And, and ask question, you, you're, you're free to do it. That's a good thing with Zoom. So is, is there anyone, uh, let's say a volunteer, you know, volunteer who would like to, uh, to open the discussion? Well, I don't, I don't see any reactions. I know there are a couple of questions here that crave to be asked by, okay, yes. From Evangelos Sestirakakis, yes, he has already pointed it out. So I can uh, give the floor to Evangelos Sestirakakis from Heinrich Böll Foundation, and also uh, Michaelis Goudis who would like to uh, to ask. He's one of us here. So let's uh, let's start with Evangelos. Uh, Mr. Sestirakakis uh, is also a member of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and he wants to ask a couple of questions. I think. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for these lovely presentations. It's really interesting to see how we can connect the, the discussion from the level of a climate law at the national level to the local application. Um, so thank you for these presentations. Uh, indeed, I am um, coordinating the democracy program at the Hanek Bell Foundation. So I have two questions. Uh, the first is for Professor Dusi. So you have talked about the climate law and how this can uh, practically uh, much more measurably help us attain the goal for net neutrality. Um, I want to ask, uh, how do you see uh, the role of biodiversity also as a tool in meeting the goal of climate neutrality within such a climate law? Is this something that um, can be considered realistic to be um, taken into account as a tool to achieving this? That's my first question. And the second question is for Deputy Mayor Anastasakis. Um, so you have presented a number of uh, applications of how the transition is taking place in Iraklio. And I wanted to ask, what would you say that was the main challenge you had to face when it comes to applying this transition at the local level in particular? So as I understand, it was not funding uh, as, as far as I understood. So is it more um, the bureaucracy that is making things difficult? Uh, is it the divided competence among many services? Or is it perhaps the participation, uh, the lack of participation of citizens? Or what do you find that this is the main um, challenge we need to overcome to apply the transition at the local level? Thank you. Okay, so uh, you can proceed with the answers. Uh, all of you would like to answer, certainly Mr. Anastasakis, but probably not only him, Mr. Medusi as well. Uh, who should start? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, so yeah, let's. Uh, yeah, let's Emmanuel Medusi can start. Okay, yes, thank you very much for this uh, very, very interesting question. And it's, um, it's a huge subject. Uh, biodiversity and climate change and uh, the role of, uh, of uh, national climate laws. Yes, of course, I think, um, I think that uh, climate laws can be um, a tool um, uh, to, to, to connect uh, biodiversity issues and, uh, and uh, climate change. So, um, um, especially to, to um, how climate change uh, affects 
um, uh, biodiversity and the other way how biodiversity can help us uh, mitigate and, um, and adapt uh, to the impacts of climate change. And I think, yes, um, uh, this uh, 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 climate law that is under, um, under uh, well, it is actually in the drafting uh, can also include these issues. And uh, I hope it will include them. So, Mr. Anastasakis? A difficult question, but I, I will be very honest. The main uh, challenge, the main obstacle in applying this transition, at first was the lack of vision from the municipality itself, the municipal authority itself. Lack of knowledge led to a lack of vision towards that matter, so we were not involved. We had uh, the center of uh, renewable energy triggering in us all the benefits for the citizens and for the municipality and the political benefits of a, a concrete strategy that had some short term, mid term and long term steps because everyone is bored of long term visions that someone, someone and someone then will implement. They need to see something specific in their everyday lives. Then, if you gain trust from the people, they give you time. And time is very critical in that. So we don't have enough time. Now we have a five-year term. We were re-elected. And we have the opportunity to materialize our thoughts. If we were not re-elected, there wouldn't be that opportunity. You don't have enough time. So what do you do? You need to have some tools, some smart tools that need to come top to bottom from the ministries. They know better about uh, the trends and they can trigger you that knowledge with 10, 20, 30,000 euros. It's not about the money. It's about putting the, the flame in Miraclio in other cities. We see that in electric mobility. Everyone knows about electric buses and uh, they are, uh, there are hundreds of ongoing designs about plugs, uh, positions of plugging in the electric vehicles. So EU was connected to the municipalities with a simple plan they gave us 20,000 euros to make this design. Uh, I don't remember the exact number of hundreds of positions that electric vehicles will be charged. The same thing is with the mobility plans. Everyone is talking about urban mobility plans in the last three years because the green, uh, I, don't, I don't remember the term, the green fund in uh, Athens gave some money to make these designs. And uh, I am saying once again, we had the money. We have millions of euros in uh, the municipality of Heraklion. But the engineers wouldn't tell us to do it. The politicians don't know about these things. So someone put the seed to take the money and you will understand in a, in a few years what it means. So we need that tools, uh, those tools that will put some seeds in uh, state of the art issues. No, the, uh, no one else's fault. There is no one else's fault. It's our business to find the opportunities to understand and to make it relevant to the people. So I think all the other obstacles are um, not of great importance because if you put the water in the channel, at some point, it will reach its destination. Well, we are, I can say, I think I, I sort of, I expressed the general feeling that we 
are enthusiastic about your responses, uh, Mr. Anastasakis, the perspectives that you have opened, the unlocking of the, the doors, because we tend to see uh, the whole thing here in Greece, the Green New Deal, as a, as a series of locked doors. We, 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 don't, we don't have this perspective of opening avenues. It's like we're bumping into obstacles. We have an obstacle-driven vision which is really not what's going what's, what's gonna to make things work. If you need a strategy, you need to give tools and keys to people, open, uh, open doors, and keep repeating that the main problem is not finance per se. It is the political will, the vision and knowledge, and of course, the commitment of the people. As you said, you give people things that they can live, they can experience in their everyday life, and they give you the most valuable full resources which in politics which is time that is the main problem we have because everybody's driven by short-term agendas so okay there is something on chat uh yes well that's a reminder so that's a question by mr michalis with uh, please michali yeah thank you um i have two questions if i may one to mr anastasakis uh, i also want to thank you for the excellent and very um a realistic presentation from uh, from your perspective. I want to go back to one of your first points, your initial points in your presentation. You talked about the challenge that tourism is uh, also giving you in Heraklion for all of these plans that you're trying. So climate adaptation is, let's say, challenged by tourism and the necessity for growth, economic growth, but in traditional terms, like we want to have more tourists, more income and so on and so forth. Uh, and we tend to see that sometimes people perceive economic growth as a competitor to climate adaptation. I want to ask how you see that and how also your collaboration to this end has been with the other players, the other stakeholders, so the regional authority and also the ministry, I guess, uh, for tourism. Uh, because I don't think this is something that you can, I mean, Heraklion is not an island on its own. Of course, you're part of, the, of Crete and so on. So I want to see, uh, I want to hear from you how you address this, not only as a municipality, but uh, with the other relevant stakeholders. And taking one of your points, I want to address a question to uh, Professor Vusi, because you showed us a good example of how a strategic roadmap can look like going beyond one or two electoral periods. So my question to Professor Vusi, uh, following up the discussion about the national climate law is whether you would see such uh, long-term commitments, uh, let's call them roadmaps or whatever we call them, being an integral part and a key role that the local administration can play so that this national climate law can be in the end effective. Do you see uh, also the local dimension of the national climate law uh, being integral part of the discussion that we're currently having or at least should it be? Thank you. So uh, let me start. I had the privilege to write our strategy concerning tourism about eight years ago, before we won the elections. And the idea was very simple. Let's make Heraklio a city break, a city break destination, because we have the second biggest airport in Greece, a very large, I think, thir third in uh, ranking harbor, but all these millions of visitors that came, arrived at the city of Heraklion, bypassed the city and flew to their destinations, big hotels, all inclusive other touristic places. So our drive was to make the city attractive for two, three days visit. So we put that plan uh, in elaboration, in a, we try to, to think, build the blocks, and we thought of improving every sector that uh, made us a bad example. We didn't have green spaces, we built green spaces. We didn't have enough pedestrian routes, we created. We didn't have public transportation, we increased the transportation and we gave it free to the people. And we 
we had the guts, the political guts to support some difficult decisions that we stood against the wind in the beginning, but now we have only supporters, as I said, with the big uh, avenue, the commercial avenue. There are, I will give you one bad example about bureaucracy, bureaucracy and political games. Within the old city, there is a small bay that used to be a public beach. We made uh, a full analysis of the, at the city front and we proved with the, uh, how do you say the, Mm. Okay, that doesn't matter with ITE, with Foundation of Research and Technology in Heraklion, that in that bay we have the most deep impact of the corrosion. And we made a detailed technical analysis to create a, 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 a sand front to protect the area from the corrosion. And we would have the benefit to create the beach that we had once in Heraklion. That project was ongoing, 2 million euro projects. And some months before the previous elections, two and a half years ago, the state blocked the ending of the project. Uh, they told us that we had some 18 months to complete the project because it was under the umbrella of uh, civil protection because of the corrosion. And we didn't have uh, other time to accomplish our plans. The, rea the real thing is that the problem is that the, no one from the opponents want to have a beach, the only beach in the city of Heraklion, just before the elections. So we had some legal obstacles that not even now we have a, we had the opportunity to overcome. Okay, so to return to your main question, we have a good cooperation with regional authorities. We have our pros and cons and uh, ups and downs with the ministries. The Ministry of Tourism didn't understand exactly what we were up to and uh, they were afraid of these uh, accusations that reached their ears. So they backed our, their uh, support to that project, that beach project. Uh, concerning uh, other civil protection and environmental challenges that are directly involved with tourism, we have a lot of work to do. Because the main problem in Heraklion is that we have an irrelevant, uh, how do you say, uh, city design, urban development design. It's 1936. And we have 2021. So people are hostage along with their properties in a map that has nothing to do with the current reality. And we, we cannot overcome the Ministry of Culture. Their local authorities in Iraq are very, very slow. They have their own problems. So, so we are stuck. And no matter what we do, we, have, we find a barrier, an irrelevant map we don't have building licenses for what we are trying to do. And not even the citizens can have building licenses. So we have a touristic city with 800 buildings that are on the verge of collapsing. 800 buildings. The first day that I became vice mayor for uh, the building licenses and the urban planning, we had the first collapse. And seven years later, the only thing that I can present to you is that we have a detailed list of all the buildings. We have sent notifications to the owners, but nothing has actually happened. Everything is very slow. And even with the fatal accident of the two young children just a few months ago, nothing changed. Everything is very bureaucratic, very slow. These things cannot be solved uh, without some brave new legislation that will allow us to go fast forward. So we have a bipolar uh, mind dealing with 
such I, I don't bad issues, everyday issues, along with a, a good vision, and you need to to work half of the day dealing with that and trying to convince people that there, there is room for vision even with that pending, that problem is pending. Okay, thank you. So, uh, any other uh, person who would like to answer the? No. Okay. So, if, 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 if Manuela. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. First please. of all, I would like to thank Michalis for his excellent question. And um, well, <laughs> um, well, all these um, the European Green Deal, uh, the local Green Deals, as the one that. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Anastasakis has um, uh, described a while ago are a collection of targets and targets always sound great before the work to meet them um, gets underway. So I think that legislation uh, uh, and especially when the electoral cycle is over, so we need a more long term perspective here. And I think that legislation could help in this direction um, and um, uh, it could help because it can um, uh, even if we have the european climate law we need also a national climate law and uh, uh, in order to manage this long-term transition towards um, uh, towards uh, climate neutrality and meet the obligations of the paris agreement um, on planning, on monitoring, on reporting also, reporting and um, uh, periodic updating of these, of these targets. Uh, uh, of course, uh, then we have to also think about, uh, about uh, um, monitoring the implementation. Of this, uh, of this climate law. And here comes another big discussion because you have mentioned a while ago uh, indicators. So here we need to, to work on some legal indicators. What do I mean by legal indicators? Um, uh, information, legal information about the implementation of, uh, of in particular, this climate law. So we need specific information, not just if we have, for example, um, uh, some decisions taken, but to actually see if these decisions are um, um, uh, applying practice. So this is very important and we have to think also about this sort of indicators. Um, of course, uh, all uh, this will need to be translated into effective policy instruments that deliver results. As I said before, um, uh, climate neutrality requires not only the decarbonization of the energy transition of the energy sector, but uh, I think um, uh, the, the policies at the national level actually focus on this issue at the moment, at least at the moment, but um, it needs changes, um, uh, uh, radical shifts in other sectors, agriculture, for example, tourism as well. Uh, so we need to think about um, the, the, the national development um, uh, strategy as a whole. And we need also to, to rethink about decisions that have been taken in the past. For example, what about the um, hydrocarbon extraction? Are we going to, um, uh, to, to follow this, uh, this project um, as, even, as, as, if, as if it doesn't mean anything to, to, this, to this shift to climate neutrality? Or are we going to rethink the whole issue, um, considering these new elements, these new data and elements, especially after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? 
So there are a lot of, a lot of um, let's say, open issues at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Manuela Tusi. Uh, it's, it's really, we have covered a lot of ground. If you don't mind, I have a question for Mr. Miltiades Lazoglu. Uh, he didn't have the chance to express himself uh, at the debate. And I think I have a question that might be of interest. Uh, the question is the following. You have, as the Limiket area, been very active, the most active in Greece, to my knowledge, in your work concerning the famous bearing capacity, ferrous ikanotita, right? Now, this is an obscure term for many people, or was at least until a couple of years ago, because these last two or three years, this term has entered uh, vigorously the uh, in public debate, and especially in places like Santorini and uh, Mykonos, uh, for example, uh, places that the uh, small islands that have been submerged by tourist waves. And my question is twofold. I have two questions in package. There's one, if you want. The first question is, do you think that there should be some kind of change in the institutional and legal framework as to insularity, nisiotikotita, right? Do you think that there should be some kind of legal recognition of the term as such, which is a term that is fairly used, as you know, in territorial cohesion by the European Union, in national terms, and even more specifically in regional terms, do you think that there should be institutional and legal changes as to this term, so as to bring to fruition this work uh, on bearing capacity? And the second question is something that is very dear to me and to all of us here, the question concerning deliberation, citizens' deliberation. Now, of course, many citizens here depend on tourism either directly for their revenues or indirectly for jobs that are attached to the supply chain concerning tourism. And especially in places like, for example, Santorini, that was very, very prevalent. Now, with the things that have happened with the congestion of these infrastructures, for example, in Santorini, many people have started to change their minds. But still, there are still, I think, probably a majority, who thinks that this notion is a limit to what we can gain out of our work. We can, you know, we, we can gain out of tourism. So there is a, this issue that Emanuela Dus pointed out from the very beginning of this conference, and of course also Yanis Anastasakis afterwards, the uh, issue of public acceptability of these measures. Social inclusiveness means also uh, the acceptance of uh, the measures concerning climate change by the people, especially by local communities. So that's the question of the liberation of citizens. Do you have any experience in that? That is my question. And do you think that there should be some kind of st structuring of the debate in terms of questionnaire and, and, and things like that, uh, that would probably lead people to understand the issues, to comprehend the issues in more long-term perspective? Because when we talk about deliberation here in Greece, it's mostly about our short-term interests right now. I don't want to be deprived of my revenues right now, of my income, because I have an ongoing business in tourism. So we'll go there and protest if you, 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 are, you, you want to, to, to put some obstacles in that, for example, under the term of bearing capacity. We should unblock as well the deliberative aspect have you done any work on this? So insularity and deliberation are the two prongs of my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, carrying capacity is, uh, is a campaign in the area began in 2013. It was about the land use and the tourism plan of 2013, I believe. Uh, the first study was about Shipnos. Uh, we tried to find the limits of development for this island. The second uh, study was about Amorgos, uh, where the main problem was uh, desertification and not tourism, and especially goats. <laughs> uh, and the third, our third study, is ongoing, is about Santorini. It's about Thira and Thiraskia. Of course, it's the most uh, complicated of the three. Uh, we have uh, managed to uh, bring to the table uh, 
the local community, uh, local authorities. Uh, we made uh, need very, very rigorous uh, collection of data. Uh, we tried to create a database about uh, Santorini. The finding data in Greece is a major problem. And uh, we believe we succeeded in this. And uh, now we are trying to uh, trying to design the measures that should be followed in order to uh, make a red line, try, trying to uh, persuade local authorities and the local community to understand that uh, new investments should be uh, more focused on uh, local society, on local activities, traditional activities. Um, they are not very keen to uh, hear this kind of things. Deliberation is, is not, uh, the, I think Mr. Anastasakis gave us a very good idea about uh, how uh, authorities in Greece uh, think about deliberation and about uh, making long-term plans. Uh, it is not easy. We have. It's not only about Sadorini. This is a general issue. We are Greeks. We all know what the dialogue means. Uh, democracy was born in in Greece, but uh, nowadays uh, it is not very easy, and especially after COVID nineteen and uh, uh, the collapse of tourism in the last year. The problem is uh, very, very intense. That's that, that, that's our experience. Uh, however, uh, we are more. There, there are more initiatives about deliberation, uh, and these initiatives maybe they are born in Athens, but nowadays we have uh, thirteen local committees all over Greece. Uh, th th these committees uh, were born uh, because uh, local societies want to learn, want to hear, want to be supported, uh, want to uh, get connected, ex exchange experience. And that's what we try to do, but it is very difficult. Okay, thank you. You haven't answered my question on insularity, though. Insularity, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe that the, and uh, this goes also to Mr. Anastasakis, I believe that the, the local urban plans, which are to be, uh, are to be developed according to the Ministry of Environment Development, is a major challenge, major uh, hope for us all. Uh, new uh, urban plans will be developed uh, during the next three years, according to the Ministry of Development. I believe that insularity uh, must be included in this uh, in these plans. However, uh, until today, insularity is a term which someone can find on a legal. Uh, document, but won't find it in an urban plan. That's correct. So uh, th we have a question in, in chat here. Uh, I will try to read it out. Uh, okay, uh, the question concerns the energy transition scheme. And it's about, it's, it's the following. Do you think that the transition to clean energy in brackets by itself would be a sufficient and sustainable solution in the long term? Or should we start at the moment regulating uh, more strictly the overall energy consumption? Of course, I have the temptation of saying that these two are not at all contradictory, that one supplements the other. But of course, I'll give the floor to anyone who would like to, to reply. So who would like to give a, to give a 
to give it a shot and you know uh, replying uh, mrs ducey of course yes please well i think this is an excellent mrs. question Lazo, this, one. Excuse and, me? Uh, yeah. this is a very good question and very well um a complex one because um um, I think um, um, at the end of my speech, I talked about uh, individual responsibility of each one of us. Is this is something that we learned? Um, we learned during the pandemic, the pandemic crisis, and it comes also uh, in the climate change crisis. So um, I don't think that the solution is to um, uh, to, to change uh, one system to another and to continue the same. Uh, way of living and consuming and uh, so I think that we should introduce modernism uh, in our daily lives become more less wasteful um, and um, uh, yes absolutely my answer is absolutely yes but we should start at the moment regulating more strictly the uh, overall energy consumption, because the solution uh, the solution is not to um, uh, uh, duplicate the same, exactly the same um, uh, behavior of consuming the way energy the way we do at the moment. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? I'm addressing myself to the uh, invisible audience here. Um, right. So any other questions, please? We're fast approaching the, uh, the end of this conference because it's almost uh, 7 uh, p.m., 1900 hours. So if there's no other question, we can conclude here. It was a short, but I think very interesting and very informative uh, conference event here. Uh, not least because we had the chance to talk between us from different horizons, different environments, with different problems, with different agendas probably sometimes, or at least if not different, from different viewpoints. Because of course, the viewpoint of a, of a practicing politician like Yanis Anastasakis is rather different from the viewpoint of an academic like Emanuela Dusis, which is once again different from the viewpoint of an engineer who is very active in implementing uh, plans, local plans for saving Greece's inimitable cultural heritage and environment, like Mr. Ndialis Lazoglu. But I think that uh, something that came out of today's discussion is that these horizons, these viewpoints, these agendas, these concerns in the uh, post COVID-19 pandemic environment can converge. And I think we have converged in several actual uh, solutions that we uh, think can be furthered uh, at a political level. One of them is, for example, the, uh, uh, the importance of strategy, long-term vision, and the importance of uh, putting on board people in this long-term strategy, which is something that is very difficult uh, given the electoral cycles and given the concerns, the everyday uh, people, you know, everyday life concerns of the people. Uh, another thing that came out, of course, is that all the different policy sectors here, several ones of them, like urban planning, like transportation, like energy, uh, and, and so on, are, of course, interrelated. We need to break down barriers at the administrative level because the bureaucracy is the big obstacle here. If the bureaucracy, the you know, classical government scheme we have is still built around policy sectors, vertical sectors, verticalized sectors, which are uh, still have a mentality of silo mentality, as we say, as a, a mentality that is closed to other sectors, that is not, that is shut, then we will not get things going. Because for example, Anastasakis, Yanis Anastasakis told us the problem that said to us that for a, for a historic uh, city such as Heraklion, a big problem is the bureaucracy of, for example, the cultural agency of, of the Ministry of Culture, the local agencies that we have. Only they probably will not, don't understand enough that 
all of this is a package and all of this is interrelated. It's not about Knossos. It's not about the ancient town of Heraklion. It's also about transportation from one to the other. It's also about the fight against corrosion of the soil. Everything is interrelated. So, I mean, there's no point anymore I think that's one of the things that came out of this discussion in uh, the, uh, envisioning things from our very limited viewpoint, which is, for example, cultural or regional or planning or whatever. That's another thing. And that is very difficult, I think, in, uh, in a political culture such as Greece, but not insuperable because the local level here, for example, Iraklion here, has actually pushed forward with a big success, I would say, several uh, of, these, uh, uh, of these issues in their agenda with the acceptance of the people. And that is something good for the future. So the, these, are, these are more or less the conclusions that I would like to focus on that I have more of them, of course, but I think that I should stop here. And I would like to pass the word to Mik Mikhailis with this, uh, for him to conclude as well. We're co-organizers here. So uh, Mikhailis. No, I mean, not much to add uh, from my side in terms of content. I think uh, I would also stick to your points. I find them really uh, a good overview of what we heard today. I, I think the interrelation is, is very, very clear. It hasn't been that obvious in the past. So I'm, I'm happy that this comes out as one of the key outcomes today. And of course, the societal uh, acceptance, the societal support. Uh, having people on board and uh, having them feel that they are part of this, that this is done, this is a transition done with them and uh, for them and for the quality of their lives now and in the future and for the future generations and not without them uh, is uh, is key. And uh, I'm, I'm also really happy with the, the way the three angles, the three different perspectives came together. And, and we're looking forward to the next change, uh, hopefully the bringing also the EU level and also potentially other national perspectives together, because it's also a matter of exchange uh, with each other within the European family so that we learn from each other, we do things uh, faster. Uh, and a good example is how Crete has done it, using so many different EU projects and EU funding streams. I mean, it's a way to do uh, more with less and uh, faster. I think this was also one, a key, very practical uh, lesson. Uh, Europe is really close to us uh, in many different ways, uh, but the EU Green Deal will make it uh, really touch our lives, or at least this is our uh, hope for now and for the future. Uh, warm thanks from my side uh, to all three speakers and uh, to you for the collaboration, and of course to everyone who stayed with us until now in this uh, really hot, first hot day of the Greek summer this year. Thanks a lot. So that's it. That's the end of this, uh, this conference. Thank you so much. And looking forward to, uh, you know, to the, the follow-up uh, with uh, other uh, events like this. This was, I remind you once again, this was an event also, I mean, formally uh, is, not was, is an event uh, uh, that is uh, put under the umbrella of the Conference on the Future of Europe as well, because that's where the future of Europe uh, is played. It's also played at local level and uh, at national level as well. So thank you all, and uh, well, to the you know to the to, to the next uh, to the next event of us. Thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Thank you. Bye.